Good morning, my freeze drying friends. Well, it's morning when I'm recording this anyway. Today's topic is going to be about the two phases of freeze drying. This is actually really important information. Why? Because the more you know about what's going on inside your freeze dryer, the more likely you are going to be able to tweak your process, uh, troubleshoot your equipment, rewrite your recipes, um, make your equipment last longer, all kinds of things. Knowledge really is power. Um, so let's get right to it. So the freeze drying cycle has two phases. Now I could be completely uninventive and uncreative and call it the first phase and the second phase or the primary phase and the secondary phase. <laughs> and that's what it's mostly called out in the world. <laughs> I guess the rest of the freeze drying world, but look, let's call it something descriptive. Let's call it what it actually is. So in the first phase, you have sublimation taking place. So I call it the sublimation phase. In the second phase, you move out of sublimation and you move into what's called desorption, where the water is actually desorbing from the surfaces of the product. Let's call that the desorption phase. Okay. So it's very clear. What phase is what? Well, you don't have to try to remember. It's it's ob it's in the very label, right? The definition is kind of inc included right in it. So in the sublimation phase, you've got product that is basically fresh frozen and um, the ice crystals suffuse the entire thing through and through. This is gonna be your fastest part of freeze drying because the rate at which you freeze dry is going to be the rate at which you can get heat into your product. So if, if you want to know more about that, I have a video on that. Please click into that. It's a great video. It just, just talks about how the sublimation rate is the heat rate. So you're going to have fastest uh, freeze drying during the beginning of the sublimation phase. And then as you move through, you are going to be decreasing the amount of ice that is in your product and it's going to decrease from the outside in. Um, that should be obvious, but if it's not, where the sublimation is actually taking place at the ice boundary, right? Not in the core, but in the ice boundary, because that's where the heat is, right? The heat has to come in from the outside, be from your shelves. It hits the surface and it travels through into the ice core um, or the boundary of ice that is around that ice core. And that's where the, the energy is gonna allow that water to go vaporous. And then it will suffuse back out of the product through that same um, barrier uh, or a little layer of already freeze dried product. So your ice crystal or your ice chunk will get smaller and smaller as you go through the freeze drying process. Once this ice crystal gets to basically zero, you've sublimated away all of the ice. You have now transitioned into the desorption phase. Hey, I got to interrupt myself real quick because I forgot to mention that at the point where you transition from sublimation into desorption, you still have about seven to nine percent moisture by weight. That's way too much. You're not fully dry yet. So you still have to go through the desorption phase and that's going to take a while, but you really got to do it. So what is happening in desorption? So it turns out that water is very sticky. Um, it's not a uh, bouncy subject, uh, uh, su um, substance. Right? It doesn't, and this is actually true of almost all gases. Remember, water vapor is in an ideal gas when it's in vaporous form. And like a lot of ideal gases, it doesn't actually bounce off of walls and stuff. It actually sticks to the walls. Uh, a lot of gases stick to the walls for a very short period of time, like nitrogen and oxygen just stick for a very short period of time and then they spring off that wall. It's so such a, it's microseconds usually or nanoseconds. But with water vapor, water vapor is actually very sticky because it's a polar substance and um, it will actually adhere to those surfaces a lot more. And as a result, it's going to stick there and stay there. Uh, so after you finish the sublimation phase, all that moisture that's suffused out through the product is, is residing in there, it's sticking to all those internal surfaces. So how do you get water to desorb from a substance? You add heat and you take time and you lower the pressure, right? Because the lower the pressure, the more likely the water is to get enough energy to spring away and to go um, to uh, be free itself from its uh, whatever it's sticking to. So this desorption phase can actually take almost as uh, a, a quarter of the entire time of the cycle. So in fact, let's look at some of that. 
Hey, I wanted you to know that if you want to reach out to me at any time, you can reach out to me at my website, suntour.com. Just go to the contact us page or you can email me, gene.ligman at suntour.com. And if you go to my website, if you want to call me, you can even find my phone number there. Thanks. Let's get back to it. Um, before I go on, let's talk about this too. If you have a shelf that is operating at constant temperature, like you do in most of the small home freeze dryers, and you also do in some of the big commercial freeze dryers, you set a shelf temperature and you leave it there. This is the, this right here is the, the shape of the curve that you get for the sublimation rate. And then eventually when you get down to here, this is the desorption phase. So you'll notice that in the first, oh, 20% of this cycle, I've already lost half of my sublimation rate. Is this, is this typical? Yeah, this is a typical decay curve. It's a first order differential equation. It's how the universe works. I mean, this is the kind of curve that describes most of how natural processes work. I mean, if, if you count how many leaves fall off a tree that's uh, in, the, in the autumn, it's gonna start with a lot. And as the tree, as a tree gets fewer and fewer leaves on, the rate at which they fall is gonna decrease. You know, it's just, uh, it's, it's a function of the rate is affected by how much is left. Okay, that's basically kind of, in a nutshell, what a first order differential equation is all about. Okay, so, oh, wow, did I derail myself on that? So anyway, this is the kind of curve you're gonna, you're gonna get if you have a constant shelf temperature. This is why it's so important when you move from home freeze dryers or very small production into a, your next stage of production that you get, a, you get a freeze dryer that you can actually program the process cycle steps, right? How it goes up in temperature, or maybe you, even you can change pressure. It depends on the machine um, along the way in order to flatten out this curve. Another thing I wanted to mention is that the geometry matters in your freeze dryer, right? So when a particle of food or whatever you're freeze drying is sitting on the heated shelf and it's getting radiation from above and it's getting conduction from below, it's going to have basically a free path for all of the water molecules that suffuse out of that product into the vacuum right around it. And then the, the vacuum would just take it away. If you've got product that's laid out on a shelf, on a tray, you're, you might notice that there's a lot more, let's call these, these little arrows represent um, water molecules, you know, coming out. So the ones that are coming out of this one are bouncing right back in there. The, the deeper you get into the shelf, the more of these water molecules that are kind of, they're not really stuck, but there's a lot more of them being generated there. So you're going to have higher pressure there. And you're going to have a slower sublimation rate and desorption rate. It's just something to keep in mind that you will probably see the product on the outside of the trays dry faster than the product on the inside of the trays. If you've got any experience freeze drying, I'm sure this is just obvious to you, but this is why. So here's what I mean when I say that if you program a machine that actually you can control the process recipe all the way through, you can change the how that curve operates, right? So this is a machine where you're doing stepwise function up in temperature of your shelves, right? So. Here's the original pump down of the machine, right? You can see temperature of the shelves plummeting. Why is that? This, uh, evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling is exactly what's cooling your product the entire time that you're freeze drying, right? You're putting heat in from the shelves. What's keeping that product cold? It's the evaporation process. Now, I don't think I've done a video on it yet, but the physics of ev evaporation tell us just from the numbers that evaporation of water takes 533 times more energy than changing that same water by one degree. Okay, one degree C. So evaporative cooling is much more powerful than let's call it sensible heat, the, the, the rate of degrees change, right? So as you pull vacuum, the pressure gets lower and lower. Remember, if you, um, if you watched my video on why does a freeze dryer operate under vacuum, it's because the lower the pressure, the lower the temperature at which you evaporate, right? Just like water boils in Denver at a cooler temperature than it does in South Carolina. So you see the pressure comes down, the temperature comes down. And then here, the heaters come on, right? Your heater set point. 
comes up to zero degrees and then it steps up to this looks like 15 degrees then about 35 degrees then 45 degrees and so on right it's stepwise function all the way to the end now what is going on with our sublimation rate well how do we measure sublimation rate ah you can actually get a really good proxy of what sublimation rate is if you've got the data to plot so this blue line here is heater power not heater power in watts it's heater power in percent of total um, that the machine can put in so you see uh, 60 80 here you can see by step, stepping up the temperature on the shelves over the course of the freeze drying cycle the heater power is kept kind of consistently between 70 ish and 80 ish percent all the way until you get to geez 27 hours in now this is a really heavy load of of meat and it's being done over a long period of time because it's a weekend run so most machines if you load it with a normal load i mean most commercial machines if you load it with a normal load of product like the what's recommended and you uh, run it with a good recipe you're going to be done in 24 hours uh, usually 20 to 24 hours okay but look what happens here now right so we've got this temperature staying steady and the heater power is falling like every time the temperature is steady you see the heater power falls right this time it starts falling a little bit more steeply you see right here the heater power is falling more steeply now we do a step up and we go to a, a steady temperature now look at the heater power now remember heater power is equivalent or it's a substitute it's an indication of sublimation rate now you can see this decay curve in real um, in real time and if if you take a, a machine that is at a steady state or a steady temperature the entire time you're going to see a decay curve like this um, but that's not what the topic is is about here what we're trying to really nail down is when have we transitioned from the sublimation phase into the desorption phase well this is when uh it's probably happening right here now i can't say that it happened at this time because you've got a lot of product it's not distributed evenly it's not all chopped the same size it's not in the same position on the shelf so you're not going to have a point at which you transition from sublimation phase into desorption phase you're going to smear into it right you're going to smear into it because some is going to be done first and then the bulk of it's going to be done in the middle and then and then the uh the the more challenging pieces or the larger pieces in the more challenging locations they're going to transition from dis sublimation into desorption last and it's the same thing with the desorption phase by the way those same products that that transition into desorption last are the same ones that are going to transition out of desorption phase into let's call it done at the end okay all right so i would probably call the transition from sublimation to desorption phase as being between 24 and 27 hours between 24 and 27 hours because my pressure is dropping quickly my power is dropping quickly this kind of looks like a knee right here in fact i might actually say wow it's actually even more uh clear here at the, about the 27 hour mark okay let's look at a different chart to see one that's mm, written so that it's a little maybe a little easier to see and by the way this is what you get with a commercial freeze dryer you get the ability to plot out your data because they all log their data you get the ability to change how the process cycle operates and this is really important because different products are going to need a different process cycle so here's a different chart right now what's so different about this one well we still have the pump down we still have the heaters coming on here and after you do your first uh temperature uh let's call it reset from off basically to 40 degrees now i think these temperatures are in fahrenheit so just be aware about that now this one's doing a very slow ramp of the temperature set point from oh 45 degrees ish to 100 and uh, let's call it 120 120 well, maybe 120 degrees fahrenheit right but look it's doing a nice slow ramp over time now look at what happens to heater power the heater power comes up to 80 percent 
and it stays rock solid on that 80% all the way out to here, which again is at the 27 hour mark, which is kind of interesting. This customer really likes to uh, push things, which is great. We like that. Uh, we want everyone who is getting a commercial machine to try to push it as, as hard as they can without compromising the quality of your product. You can do that with a machine that you can program. You can do it. All you have to do is figure out how to program it differently. Now, this kind of chart, this kind of process recipe, this is the kind of thing I do with customers just like every week. I, I talk with customers about how to tweak their process recipes in order to get the best quality in the shortest period of time, how to optimize the operation of their machine. Okay, so now look right here. At, at some point, even during this very slow ramp up, the heater actual temperature finally gets up to the heater set point. So this line, these two lines here, the purple and the light blue, this is the actual heater temperature. This is the heater set point. But here they actually meet and then look what happens to heater power it starts falling off on that decay curve I talked about, right? This is because the, the heater power or the heater temperature finally caught up to the, to the temperature set point. I'm going to say that you're probably starting to get close to the end of your sublimation phase. And you can see how steep this heater power is falling off, right? Somewhere in this band between 28 and 32 hours, you have exited the sublimation phase and you've gone into desorption. I'm thinking it's earlier. It's probably in the 28 to 29 hour range instead of the 30 to 32 hour range. Okay. So where's the product fully dry? It's where the heater power really flattens out. When, when you get your heater power down to 10%, at least in the machines that I'm familiar with, you're pretty much, uh, yeah, you're pretty much done with your process. So why is it that the sublimation rate, changes heater power. How does that work? Well, because as the product it, uh, gives off that water vapor, right? As it gives off this water vapor first here, a little less here, a little less here, that water vapor is cold. That water vapor is the temperature of the ice when it comes out. You, you can't gain heat. Yeah. It, it turned into quote steam, but it's cold steam, right? And that cold steam is blowing on these shelves. It's either impacting the tray, that the product is sitting on or this water vapor is traveling up and hitting this heater that's right above it, cooling it. So when the shelf is cooled by the product, both from ab uh, above and below, that says to the control system, hey, my, my shelf isn't up to the temperature I need. It's like your foot on the accelerator pedal, right? You, you push more on the accelerator pedal Try to get your car up to speed, and then when it gets to speed, you back off, right? That's a that's a standard control system, an electric an electronic control system. It's called a PID control. So if you ever wondered what that was, people fling around this name, this PID controller. Well, that's it's just like the accelerator pedal in your car. This is why the heater power responds to what's going on with your product because the product is exhausting this cold, wet wind onto the heaters, and they've got to. They've got to crank more power into them to, to get up to temperature or to stay at temperature. And then when you get to the point where the water vapor is a lot less, now your heater temperatures um, are easy to maintain by your heater power. And you have a dramatic drop in how much power you need to put into those. And that's why heater power is such a good indication of where you are in your process cycle. Okay, this is, I hope, really great information for you. I hope you get a lot of value out of this. If you did, if you're still with me, please hit the like button. Um, I really want to continue to make this, these sorts of videos. Um, I think that the, the freeze drying community is really underserved with how much information is available on freeze drying. And it's not new, right? It's, it's not, it's, this process has been around for, I don't know, 70 years or something like that. And yet the information that's available to people is maybe kind of embarrassingly terrible. So yeah, give me a like if you will. Subscribe to my channel. I'm going to have a lot more really good uh, things to share. And uh, until then, 
Happy freeze drying.